This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello and welcome to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Thank you for joining us. We're your hosts. My name is Marcy Davis and my co-host is my trusty service dog, Whistle. And we're thrilled to be with you today to talk about our favorite subject, working dogs and working animals. And today we're going to visit with our good friend, Dr. Margaret Glenn. And Margaret is an associate professor of rehabilitation counseling at West Virginia University. And she's going to talk with us today about an innovative research project that she's working on regarding assistance dogs in the workplace. And Margaret is really working to understand the role of assistance dogs in the lives of people with disabilities and issues that they may be encountering in the workplace. So this is really cool, groundbreaking research, and we can't wait to learn more about it from our good friend, Dr. Margaret Glenn. So come right back after these quick messages as we welcome Margaret to the show. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Your dog digs a hole under your fence, and the next thing you know, protect your pets with Dig Defense, the amazing new product that keeps your pets in the yard. Dig Defense is safe, fast, and easy. Each unit is made from 4-gauge galvanized American steel and can be used for repairing digouts, filling gaps, or to hold fences down so pets can't get under them. Dig Defense provides peace of mind that your pets are contained humanely and safely. Visit digdefense.com today. D-I-G-D-E-F-E-N-C-E dot com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Today, we're welcoming Dr. Margaret Glenn to the show. Hello, Margaret, and welcome. Hello. Thank you for inviting me to uh, be on the show. Yeah, well, we're so excited you could be with us. We've been anxious for you to stop by so we could hear more about this awesome research project that you're working on. Tell us. Tell us all about it. Well, I have to start with saying that I'm absolutely flummoxed that nobody has actually done this before because I, a year ago, I was fortunate to receive funding from the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research in response to an application I did for uh, what turned out to be my sabbatical for the last year to look at what are the elements of successful service dog partnerships in the um, workplace. I had started to receive and was getting involved in a service dog program we have in our area, and we were getting phone calls that said that people were having difficulty getting jobs with their service dogs. So I started looking at the literature and talking to another resource that we have at West Virginia University, the Job Accommodation Network, which is funded by the Department of Labor, and realized that nobody had really written or done any research to look at this issue of how does it work to actually go to work with your dog. And like I said, it's just amazing to me. So I got to spend the last year, thanks to NIDER, talking to people, surveying, getting to know the field, and I've learned so much. It's been an incredible year. So where would you like me to start? Wow. Well, like, well, I can share with our listeners that Whistle and I had the opportunity to, to meet Margaret and to participate in a couple of the interviews because, I guess, tell us about how you designed your project and about the interviews that you've been conducting throughout the country. Well, we had to design it from the idea that this is exploratory. When researchers put their heads together to come up with research questions, they usually go to the literature first. They find out what other people have been doing, and they build on it. When I went to the literature, I couldn't find anything to build on. The only article I could find was written by a professor, Ames, in out of California, who had basically given a review of legal actions that had been taken. And I don't know, employment policy and procedures, I'm not really sure, should come out of the courts. It should come out of data-driven information. So we started with, let's just get to the very basics and learn as much as we can from people who've done it successfully. 
and start with that information. So the first project we did is something called Concept Mapping Pattern Matching, which is a great way to start to set what are the procedures that we need to check into with more research. So we got to brainstorm. I had 68 people who came together online, and some of them brainstormed what they thought was necessary or could help a service dog partnership be successful. And other people sorted them into categories, and then we came up with a nice list of elements that people were able to rate according to how important they thought it was and whether or not we needed research. Bottom line is we need a lot of research to help people uh, as they make their arguments to have a dog with them at work and also to help employers and people like me who are vocational rehabilitation counselors help people with disabilities make it all happen. So we did that first. And then I had a lot of fun traveling around the country, meeting people who have used their dogs successfully in different work and arenas. I had everything from people who had were in part-time employment to full-time, people who were self-employed and their own businesses, and people who were using their dogs for different reasons. I mean, one of the things that we know is that people are beginning to discover that a service dog can help them address a lot of medical issues as well as help them perform general tasks. So one of the concerns that is showing up from the phone calls to the Job Accommodation Network was, okay, we get guide dogs for people with vision impairment. We even get mobility assistance. We're not sure about the rest of the inquiries that we're getting, people who are using it for diabetic alert, epilepsy, seizure response, psychiatric service dogs. So I made sure that each of those types of dogs was represented in the group of people that I got to interview. That's what I've been doing, and it's been an interesting process. Well, it's just so timely. I mean, as more and more dogs are, as we're realizing what dogs can do for us, like you said, and all the different types of medical alert dogs, service dogs, there's just so many different jobs that dogs have now assisting people with disabilities. And it just seems to be growing every day. And especially too with veterans who are returning mm-hmm. and, and now utilizing assistance dogs as post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, it's really a time issue that people will be in the workplace and that they are mm-hmm. going to have these working dogs and how are employers supposed to deal with that because there really is no training or no guidebook out there in how an employer, what's their responsibility, what questions can they ask, what can they not ask. So are you looking at those things too, Margaret? Yeah, one of the concerns that came up pretty early in the work that I was doing, uh, even on the survey, I had asked people to participate who'd actually had experience, you know, with their dog in the workplace. And it became clear that not a lot of people understand the laws that are governing this whole issue of employment and people with disabilities and their service animals. So that one needs a lot of, people need a lot of information. Employers need it. People with disabilities need it. Even folk rehab counselors. I had to go, I've been in the field for 35 years. I was in D.C. when the ADA was uh, passed and I had to go back and really read it carefully because there's a lot of distinctions that people are making misconceptions about. I think could cause them problems and not help them in the long run. So how they ask the questions, how employers, how they negotiate with employers, some of that we still need to look at. I'm only doing exploratory. Even the elements that we came up with that said these are the kind of things that help a partnership work, they're not really empirically validated. Yet. They're a place for a start, and they shouldn't be used as a, this is, these are the 68 things that have to happen or else it's not going to work. But uh, the big one is the understanding of the law and how to negotiate that conversation with an employer is important to a person. You mentioned about the Job Accommodation Network. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us more about that? Who are they? And is that something that an individual with a disability would contact? Or is it for employers? Because I think that's a great resource for people. It's a phenomenal resource. I mean, it's been around for decades. And I'm lucky. I'm at West Virginia University where it's housed and has always been housed. And probably the best resource for both employers and people with disabilities and even folk rehab counselors to call to talk to somebody who has a great deal of knowledge. Or if they don't know, they can go out and find out. They've got the resources to go out and find out more information about 
what type of accommodation works for a person on the job with a particular disability or limitation, and also what's reasonable, because there's this issue of reasonable accommodation, and that language shows up as when we talk about service dogs. It's not a given that your dog can go to work with you. There needs to be a reason why you're using your dog to work, but there also has to be no undue hardship for the employer at the other end. And sometimes needs a, a more experienced person giving you some advice about what that might look like. Or if an employer is wants to call and find out, just do I have to provide anything for this dog? Or whose responsibility is it to do the breaks? Or, you know, what's my responsibility? They're excellent resources for all that information. I mean, they really are one of the best things we've got going in the, the world of disability and employment. Yeah, that's excellent because I don't think a lot of people know about them, especially employers, that they mm-hmm. can contact them and, and use them as that great resource because I know there is a lot of confusion out there. People with disabilities think that they automatically can take their dog to work and I think they're not really sure about how to approach their employer or how to do that, you know, because it you really don't want to talk about your disability, so that's awkward in the first place. But then mm-hmm. when you have this big dog that's by your side and that you need by your side, then that's a whole nother issue that has to be addressed. And I think there's a lot of fear out there from employers that don't really know clearly how assistance dogs are trained and what they do for the individual. And they don't think of them as another piece of technology that we're using. It's just the same as my power wheelchair that I use, but it's this incredible, really cute thing that I use as opposed to lots of metal and and an inanimate object. It's this beautiful, furry little creature that everybody, well, not everybody, but a lot of people really want to pet and interact with. And that really is unsettling for a lot of employers just because they're not educated and they don't know how to interact with the dog. They don't know what the dog's job is. So the more that can be out there to share information like that and to really break down those barriers is just phenomenal. You know, one of the things that I had to learn, I grew up around a lot of people with disabilities because my mom worked at a rehab center and I was rather naive about the experience people have had with disability to begin with. And employers, for for a lot of reasons, they're they're looking at an unknown. And so disability sometimes can be the pink elephant in the room because there are things you can't ask and you don't have to tell somebody what your disability is. All you have to do is make the request for accommodations for specific tasks. So there's that. Now you've got an animal that's another pink elephant in the middle of the room, as we we would say, and you need to be able to articulate and know what the limits are of what you have to say. And I think out of this will come some really more information about how could you communicate to somebody, let's say you have a psychiatric service dog, and you really don't want to get into a lot of details about why you have that service dog. You know, you don't want to explain maybe hospitalizations or whatever. And you don't have to because one of the things that I've learned in my research is how much impact service dogs have on the mental health of people who have psychiatric disorders is absolutely amazing. The progress people say they've made with their dog. So you might want to talk about the medical alert the dog does. You're not hiding anything. It's a fact. But, you know, it does get uncomfortable to talk about the details of your disability. And for employers, they really don't want to have to know all the details. We sometimes share way too much in the world. But going back to Jan, if somebody wants to actually look at the information they have about service animals, they've done a really good job, they can go to askjan.org, A-S-K-J-A-N.org, and begin to look at what information they've provided on that website. They've done a great job. They really have. There's actually one person who answers the phone that is the expert on service animals. Oh, great. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so glad that you mentioned that website because that was one of my questions is how can our listeners get more information about Jan? So we'll make sure and include that on your web page about your show Mm -hmm. today so that Mm -hmm. we can really make sure people know how to access them. Well, we are going to take just a really quick break and we're going to come back and continue visiting with Margaret because we want to know more about what she's learned so far in this process. So come right back after these quick messages from our sponsors we'll be right back right after these messages stay tuned
Dog Shelter Blues, the new novel by Mark Conkling. This hard-hitting story lights up the world of animal rescue with engaging characters and their pets, struggling with their own internal demons as they attempt to rescue innocent creatures that sometimes bring a mysterious transforming power to broken lives. Read the first chapter of Dog Shelter Blues free at dogshelterblues.com. Then come along a breathtaking journey that ends with an astonishing triumph of good over evil. Order your copy of Dog Shelter Blues today. Available at amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com. Seeing, hearing, sensing, supporting, there's a dog for that. Did you know that assistance dogs include guide dogs, service dogs, hearing dogs, medical alert dogs, and even more? Celebrate International Assistance Dog Week, August 4th through August 10th. Organize or take part in an Assistance Dog Week event. For more information, visit assistancedogweek.org. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Pet Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. And we're visiting today with Dr. Margaret Glenn. And Margaret is telling us all about the really awesome research that she's doing about assistance dogs in the workplace. And Margaret, we were talking a lot about the Job Accommodation Network and and the work that you're doing. And I was just wondering if you could tell us more about what you've learned so far. I know you're still in the middle of all of this, but tell us about some of the things that, that you've learned. Well, I could probably start out by breaking it down to what how I would communicate to different people who who were uh, represented in the research, and I made sure that I got to talk to people who were using their service dogs in the workplace. If they had voc rehab counselors, I talked to them, or other healthcare, I talked to therapists, as well as some employers and the trainers that are part of that whole thing that makes it all come together, and. I had an aha moment one day, and if I was asked by an employer or was talking to someone, there aren't a lot of people with service dogs actually applying for jobs. So it's not like every employer is going to have 15 of them suddenly show up for a job interview. But what I would say to what I've learned, and I will talk about my bias. I am a dog lover, and I'm very familiar with disability. But I would tell an employer that if you had a person with a disability come into your, an interview with the right attitude, their deportment, their dress, behavior, you know, how they communicated, as well as the skills that they needed to do the job effectively, and they happened to have a partner that had four legs sitting beside them, know that you have a, two people who are exhibiting the same kinds of attitude, positive attitude, effective behavior, skills sitting in front of you. If that dog is well-trained and attending to the person in the way they need to and not causing a problem in the interview, you actually have an elite team because it's not easy. I think a lot of people have the attitude that it's just a person with a disability bringing their companion animal in. That it's not much more than what they have to do with their dog at home. And I think of all the things that I learned was how much work it was for a person to have a service dog in their life working with them. And what discipline it takes, what attention to detail and commitment that it takes from that person is extraordinary. And that would make for me an extraordinary employee for anybody. Because if they can do it with a dog, they can do it in a job. It's transferable skills at at its best. And the other thing is that from the coworkers I talked to, there was an added benefit of having the dog in the workplace. Even though there's etiquette about not really engaging with the dog while it's got its vest or its cape on, while it's working. Well, I think I remember you heard the one person say, you know, when the person comes in with the dog, even though nobody is interacting with the dog, I can feel any stress reducing in the middle of a meeting. So there's added benefits that I think we're going to learn more about as we do more research for the employer. And at the same time, for the person with a disability, I've been asking the people I've interviewed, I've gone back and started asking them, you know, what would you say to somebody who is considering this? And the first person say, are you sure? Are you really sure you're ready to put this kind of commitment into something? 
And that is at the heart of all of this. This is a true partnership that very few people have an opportunity to engage in in their life. It's a 24-7 commitment and what it brings to the person with a disability is only part of the equation. I mean, I sat with people in restaurants with their dogs and just watch people come by and smile because they see the dog. I mean, it just, it just has a, a great uh, impact on the whole community. I couldn't agree more with you. <laughs> the, and, and having a dog for over 20 years myself and working, it's a gift, I think, to the workplace. And I've mm-hmm. had so many coworkers that have come by just to say, I need a hug from Ramona mm-hmm. today, or I need a hug from Morgan. Just that, just that, you know, they were having some issue themselves and just how the dog was a benefit in the workplace that really was there not only supporting me, but was also supporting all my coworkers and was always mm-hmm. available available to give them that support which which is just so huge and and for myself you know when i got my first dog i had a professional job i thought i was very independent and doing really well but i didn't realize the impact of having Ramona and what that would mean and how I could do my job because all of a sudden I was able to drive independently. I was able to be out in the public independently and I got a promotion at my job within two months of having her just because Mm -hmm. it increased my ability so much that I was able to move up in my job, which was awesome. And I didn't even realize that I wasn't able to move up because I didn't have her her. But it was definitely she was the reason that I was then able to climb up the ladder a little bit higher because of what she enabled me to do. I actually was contacted by someone I knew because there was a service dog coming into the workplace and she was concerned. And I said, well, I've got all these elements and I can send them to you. What's your concern? She said, well, we're all dog lovers. And we don't know how we're not going to, like, grab this dog every moment of every day. So I said, well, let me send you the elements. And all I can tell you is there's one in there that says dogs need play breaks. Maybe you can accompany the person out on their breaks and you can get your moment with the dog off best, you know. And so they've actually done that. But, you know, I've, I've heard people talk about all the barriers that are put up. And that's one of the things we wanted to look at with this, you know, when people start talking. About, I'm really beginning to think the entire world's allergic to a dog. But when you look at the statistics, it's not that high. But you hear about allergies and you hear about people's fear of dogs. Those things can be accommodated in the workplace. They're not hard. They're not to do in most workplaces if you think it through. And we also are going to be learning a lot more about the effect that the dog has on the productivity of the person themselves and maybe even the people around them because West Virginia University is working with the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health and they're actually going to do laboratory-based clinical trials looking at the effect of a service dog, just a companion animal and no dog on simulated work that people are doing who have PTSD. They're focusing on veterans. So there's going to start being a lot more information available to employers. But at the first glance, I don't get where this is not a win-win for most employers to consider. But I have told a lot of voc rehab counselors that I've talked to who have had successful experiences with a consumer getting a job with a service dog that they have to remember that it's not for everyone. One of the interviewees that I talked to, she said, I tell people all the time, this is not a get out of jail card. You still have your disability. You still have to work with that. And now you really have to work with a dog. And she said, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me, but it's not for everyone. And I agree. Um, Yes, It's not a one-size-fits-all issue at all. And to be honest, the 68 elements we've come up with are phenomenal for helping people negotiate and look at the things that they need to think about, but they're really just the details. It goes back to, you know, how confident are you in your ability to, as a person with a disability, to negotiate the world. And if I could do anything, I would make sure that every city in the country does exactly what Berkeley is doing right now and give business, people who apply for business licenses, information about a service animal coming into their place of business because I can't imagine going through life constantly hearing, you can't have a dog in here in a restaurant or something when that's really not the case. And I would love to see people emulate the one place we went into when they said, is that a service dog? And the person said, yes, it's said, welcome. And that's what I would love to see across the board because it does make a huge difference for people. 
in yeah, the world. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, tell us, Margaret, if you had some advice based on what you've learned so far, what would your advice be to employers and to assistance dog partners? The first thing is know the law. I mean, really, truly know the law. Be comfortable with it. Be comfortable with the distinctions of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And Title III doesn't limit it to dogs. There's all of those little nuances that are different. It's not a given. The public access titles of the Americans with Disabilities Act allows dogs in anywhere where the public can go. That's not the case for employment sites. Take it from a, I'm a counselor, obviously, and I like people to approach it from a critical thinking stance. Really critically think through what it means for the person sitting across from you either to be accepting the the dog into their work environment or if you're an employer, what it means for that person with a disability to have their dog with them at the workplace. To be honest with you, By the time people get to an interview or if they've taken on a dog in their life, it's no longer acceptable for them in their world not to have the dog with them. It just makes such a difference. So it's a little bit of put yourself in the other person's shoes as you go into this conversation because we can be our own worst enemies in our sometimes in our in making an argument for what we want. But I also tell people, always remember the laws are minimum standards. And they're not supposed to limit us. They're supposed to help us by setting a limit, a minimum standard for what we want to do. What else have I learned? But it's just, I've learned so much. It's hard to put it into a half an hour conversation. I guess. <laughs> well, and what would you tell someone who is thinking about getting an assistance dog of how to talk to their employer about it? What would your advice be? You know, that seems to be um, the one where there's the most diversions in what people have communicated to me. Employers say they just want people to be upfront and honest about what's going on and to include them in the process because not every employer is the same, but most of them want to make the job work for the person. And I would say having sitting down and having a conversation early in your decision making would be important because you're going to want your dog at work with you. This is not something you leave home at, you know, at 9 o'clock like we leave our pets at home and maybe have a dog walker come in. You're going to be coming in and it's going to require certain things like going away for training, depending on the service dog trainer that you use, that you may have to go away for a couple weeks to be trained and there might be limits to what you can, how you can use your sick leave or annual leave for that kind of effort. Well, sick leave, annual leave is usually your own given. But the big thing is just to be thoughtful of the relationship you have with your employer and sit down and have the conversation with them. Yeah. But do your homework first. Call the Jan, call, read the information that you need to read. There's some great books. In fact, your book is one I recommend a lot, your guidebook uh, to service dogs in the workplace. You really need to think it through very, very carefully about how it's going to impact all parts of your life, including your family members. You know, I keep hearing that sometimes family members are more problematic than some of the employers are. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know when I was trying to decide if an assistance dog was right for me, I did exactly what you were saying, Margaret. I talked to my employer, told them what I was thinking about to see if they had any issues or any concerns. Talked to my husband, Franz, to see if he had any issues or concerns because it is. It is a life-changing decision Mm -hmm. that you're making, and it's a lifetime commitment that you're making financially, emotionally. You know, it really is. Is. And I, I just am so glad to hear you say these things and to really start having some information to back that up because that's been my practical experience. But to really have some evidence to support that, I think will be so helpful to people in the future who are considering getting assistance dog and, and who are living well and having a high quality of life with their assistance dog. Because as we know, employment is the key to having a better financial life and a better financial life gives you more choices Mm -hmm. and more opportunities. So I just just really applaud what you're doing and I'm just so thrilled that you're doing it and tell us how can we find out the results how are you going to share the results from your work well with you (laughs) Marcy and I've decided that the fact that we haven't done anything is just absolutely amazing because every service dog should come with a warning label you will fall hopelessly madly in love with your partner in all of this 
And so it's just like, in my field, as we have researchers, we research the devil out of assistive technology all the time. And when I realized we hadn't done anything in this area, I'm like, what? So one of the things that we're going to do, you and I together, is out of the International Assistance Dog Week press releases and our ability to use that mechanism, we're going to spend a year communicating to people in as many ways as we can find information from experts, from resources, from the research through, you know, obviously I'm going to be doing articles and I just did a conference presentation at the American Veterinary Medical Association, but we need to get it out to the lay public as much as possible. The Job Accommodation Network, we're in conversation with them about how might they disseminate the information and work with us, but also just get it out in as many forms as we possibly can, communicate to the trainers, to people who are working with employers and disability, as well as through the professional networks of train when you train vocational rehabilitation counselors. So we're going to try to get it out as many ways as possible. Yeah, that's excellent. And we will Mm -hmm. definitely be including information about it at assistancedogweek.org and also at workinglikedogs.com. So we definitely will be trying to support you, Margaret, and and getting that Mm -hmm. word out. And as you said, I'm so glad you brought that up, that in honor of International Assistance Dog Week, this is one of the reasons that we're talking about this right now. It's so timely. And Assistance Dog Week is always the second week of August. Um, And this year, it's August. August 4th through the 10th. And so Margaret has will be getting information out about the work that you're doing. And then next year, in 2014, Margaret and I are partnering together to share the results that you will, will be having and be distributing. So it's really a great way and a great time of year to do that in, in honor of International Assistance Dog Week. So I just think that's going to be phenomenal of how this is going to impact the future of working dog teams in the workplace and just how society really interacts and and approaches and thinks about assistance dog partners, which is is just the coolest thing ever. I know, Margaret, we could sit and talk about this all day, (laughs) so you have to promise to come back and visit with us more throughout the year as you're working and and learning more and and just share with us what what you're discovering. Thank you for the opportunity. It really it's like I pull one thread and it just pulls more and more and more threads out every day. I met phenomenal trainers. I have met people with disabilities who have accomplished more than they ever thought they would. I had one person say, remember, Margaret, most people go in to get a service dog for independence. They're not thinking employment at that moment. And it's not until later that they really realize how far they're going to be able to go in their life now that they have their dog. And yeah. that has shown up over and over and over again, particularly with veterans, particularly with the, the veterans that I've talked to. So cool. It's just so awesome. Yeah, it, mm-hmm. it just is. Well, thank you so much, Margaret. And thank you, our listeners, for being with us and our sponsors for making our show possible. And we're just so glad that you'd be with us today. And please keep those emails coming. Whistle and I love to hear from you. And you can email me at Marcy, M-A-R-C-I-E at PetLifeRadio.com. And remember, you can always follow Working Like Dogs on Facebook and Twitter and read our blog at WorkingLikeDogs.com. So take good care and we look forward to being with you again soon. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.